Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being here after lunch in this nice venue and also uh, on a full stomach. <laughs> so hopefully we can share this uh, period of time together and uh, keep each other um, engaged. I have a partly uh, interactive session and partly uh, informational session. So I first want to thank Shu Yuan University for organizing this day and also um, encouraging me to think about questions in a different way. So uh, the nature of this program and the kinds of questions that are being asked and also the wonderful speakers that have come from so far from uh, overseas, from UBC um, and elsewhere, and reading some of the work that has uh, come from the colleagues in this day has helped me to think of what I was doing up until this point in a very different way. So I was just speaking with Professor Reiner and Professor LeBaronum at lunch, how much of their work has helped me to think very differently and in a fresh way about some of the questions that we're all uh, thinking about, how to make effective uh, spaces for resolution of conflict, um, and how various insights from various disciplines can enhance our ability to improve uh, what we do in practice informed by what we know from research. So that's the hope for this short presentation. I'm going to look at this question of encouragement. Um, and this is a new area. It's something I think we all intuitively are familiar with um, on an interpersonal level, how we encourage one another. Um, and so there are some wonderful insights from um, psychology about encouragement. And given the, the theme of neuropsychology and um, uh, insights from uh, various disciplines on mediation, I thought to look into this. Because it's something that I know I, at an intuitive level, we understand encouragement is very important um, in our daily life. But how does it affect mediation practice on an interpersonal level? And how does it affect mediation practice on an institutional level within courts? Uh, what's the role of encouragement? Um, so we're going to look a little bit about at, at some of the existing work, the existing research, and then um, discuss some of this as it relates to our own uh, experience. So as, it, as described in the abstract, um, encouragement is something that we're familiar with, but how it relates to the practice, the resolution of civil um, disputes in courts and within uh, various mediation contexts is something that requires further um, investigation. And so we're going to start to look at some of these questions. Um, so the first part of this presentation is looking at what existing insights from psychology exist about the nature of encouragement. What is its function and role? How does it work? Um, there's some very good work by Y.J. Wong um, who talks about various levels of encouragement. And he describes encouragement as an expression of affirmation through language or other symbolic representation to instill courage, perseverance, confidence, inspiration, or hope in a person within the context of addressing a challenge or realizing a potential. So I think that those of us who work in mediation, and I recognize many of my colleagues in Hong Kong here who are very active and who work tirelessly in, in many different contexts, in medical mediation, in civil mediation. Um, it's definitely a challenge. So what is then the role of our symbolic language, our expression of affirmation, um, instilling courage? How does this help us to overcome the challenges within mediation? Um, so at the basic level, this is from Y.J. Wong's uh, work, these three levels of encouragement. Um, encouragement is an act of interpersonal communication. It's the things that we say to one another or the gestures, um, as Professor LeBaron describes also in some of her work, the gest gestures of, of encouragement um, that, that function across individuals that help to build courage in, in others. At the second level, we can see this as a character strength. It's something that can be developed. It's a virtue, how to instill courage in others. And it can be taught. Um, and it yields benefits not only to the person who receives the encouragement, but also to the one who gives the encouragement. And then at the third level, um, 
this research finds that encouragement can also become part of a group norm. So you can have a workplace that's characterized by an encouraging culture, or you could have a workplace other than that, a non-encouraging um, norm. So this, this can also uh, affect the environment that we work in. Um, and when we do find a strong culture of encouragement, um, this can bring out greater uh, diversity of expression, for example. When, when you have a space where there is uh, mutual empathy, people are more willing to share their views. So what are the implications then of this particular research at the basic level? Um, so this, in some sense, it corrects this individual basis that exists in most research. So usually when we do research, we're asked to, very, to pick a unit of analysis. Is it the individual? Is it the institution? I know this is something we teach our research method students. You have to pick one unit and be very clear, and it only is that unit that you're looking at in terms of impacts or effects of various um, actions. But here, uh, according to this research, this Y.J. Wong's um, three levels of analysis, it's very interesting in that it expands this idea of unit of analysis to the individual, the interpersonal, and the collective, which I think is very helpful um, in, in looking at some of these questions. And it also looks at sort of this psychological concepts of virtues, this virtue of encouragement. How does this affect group norms, organizations, interpersonal dynamics? OK, so I just have a question first as we, as we jump into this topic for the group um, to think about the most recent experience that you've had either providing encouragement to someone or receiving encouragement for someone. What were the elements uh, involved in either giving or receiving encouragement that you found to be effective, to be helpful? So maybe let's just take a couple minutes with your partner or those around you to share what you remember, what was it that made that act of sharing encouragement effective, either from your own to someone else or someone else encouraging you?
looks like there have been a lot of uh, interesting conversations. If anyone would like to or feels comfortable to share maybe one or two elements from your discussion about what you found, what were those factors that made the encouragement effective? If anyone would like to share. Yes, please. Give a try. Uh, push someone to give a try. So, and he, he can feel, then later he can feel the result, then he will continue to do that. Okay. So you s recently you saw this in an uh, experience. Wonderful. Yeah, sometimes someone is just, uh, I'll share with you my daughter. She, I was just sharing her, she got her ears pierced. She's nine. So this was her goal, but she's very scared. And uh, just like you said, she... Um, her friends, her friends around her helped her to have, to, to feel that she could take, to overcome that very major sense of fear that she had. They, they both came next to her and joined, accompanied her. Actually, they, they came to the place that she was going to go and, and sat with her. And that was very, um, that was very effective. So being in the same place and sharing words of encouragement. Other examples, what were some other things that you've seen recently? Either receiving or providing? Yes. Uh, from, from our sharing, you know, um, it, it looks like one of the elements uh, in encouragement is uh, future focus. Mm. Right. So uh, we got stuck at this point in time. It does not mean that, you know, things will not uh, improve right. in the future. So, so it looks like one of the common elements that we had uh, in our group is uh, future focus. Right, and that's very relevant, isn't it, to mediation practice. That's something that you find in very effective mediation um, practices is someone who is helping the parties to look beyond just this present stumbling block, that there's something much better ahead if, if these things, these details can be worked out. So that's exactly. a very helpful example. Any other, uh, yes? Lately I've been trying to practice meditation uh, regularly, so I need lots of support. So a group of friends, um, they, they um, support me by sending me WhatsApps every day, um, reminding me <laughs> That's your, have you done your 20 minute meditation today? So that was real, uh, I received lots of positive energy. And um, it's like, uh, I feel love and care. So that, yeah, so, so the, the energy was amazing. That's a wonderful example. And that's a positive use of technology. We were just talking about this in the bus with Dr. Reiner. The, <laughs> the technology can suck us in and distract us from the world, but it also can help us to do some positive things in our life, like meditate. Um, and we can be part of a community through these networks. And meditation itself can be a source of encouragement. For It can refresh us and help us to deal with the new day that we're facing and the various challenges that may come up. So that's a, that's a multi-leveled multi example. It's very, that's wonderful. Any other, yes. Um, recently, I have an initiative uh, to try to be a vegetarian myself. So, and while my friend is someone who, whose wish is to encourage more and more people who eat vegetables to be a vegetarian, so we basically we encourage each other, and it's also through WhatsApp, like like that lady. And I, I've told her that you might not be able to influence everyone in the world, but at least you have influenced me. So, so I think this phrase did provide her with a certain level of encouragement. And also, she would encourage me to be persistent. So uh, for at least uh, like Monday to, to, to keep to have great Monday and don't eat any meat. So, ah. so I think it's a very good interaction That's between the wonderful. two. The meatless Monday. My, my nieces have got me into the meatless Monday. So when we visit, they're also vegetarian. And that's a really wonderful example of how just an interpersonal dynamic can have a collective shift. It can have a collective impact. So these uh, small interactions add up. Are there any other, other stories? So this, this I think, gives us an, a view of sort of the spectrums of how a, a encouragement can be applied and also its, its relevance to mediation, to also social change, to collective change, also individual change, meditation, 
personal transformation, also social responsibility, vegetarian diet. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very important tool and something I know I haven't looked at empirically or systematically. So it's, it's interesting to think about what are some of the, the dynamics of this process. Um, and, the, and indeed, there's a number of directions where research can go to look at this uh, more fully. For example, how effective are various interventions of encouragement? Is just, so for example, the difference between words and actions. So saying something, putting a banner up, a bumper sticker, what's the difference between that and going with someone, accompanying them, assisting, for example? So yeah, how, how do we assess the difference in these interactions? Um, traits of encouragement, how do they correlate with each other, other strengths that an individual may have or a collective? Um, and when encouragement may lead to desirable or undesirable outcomes. Sometimes we can encourage someone to do something negative or terrible. So how do we also uh, be mindful that the encouragement is in a, is in a positive direction? Okay, so that's uh, one branch of research that I found interesting and I thought might be of interest to the group today. Another is uh, another branch of research that's looking at why positive encouragement works better than criticism. So, um, and this again has implications for mediation practice, family dynamics, work dynamics, etc. cetera. Um, and this comes largely from the work of um, Goleman, Daniel Goleman. And he's written two books that have crystallized some of this, uh, Social Intelligence and Focus, both of these books uh, draw out some of these findings. One of, so one of the, the strands is looking at how positivity affects our performance. Uh, so when we are in an environment of positivity, or uh, there's been scientific research finding that this enhances the performance of the individual and the group. Um, so, and this is contrasted to negative emotions. So if, if for example, when we are feeling negatively or poorly or uh, depressed about a certain issue where our performance is going to be impacted by that feeling in a negative way and vice versa. Positive feelings, positive encouragement, um, a forward-looking orientation is going to actually help us to perform better. And so again, this uh, has direct implication for mediation in the sense that that opening statement, when we first meet with parties, how we paint a picture of this opportunity and the fact that these parties are here and they're making an effort, this is really important because it does set a tone. And when parties, when individuals feel that they are, um, have a positive outlook, their performance is affected in a positive way. Um, so, and then some of the research that exists looks, you know, both at the positive and negative. So, Conversely, when we are in a negative mood, um, I think intuitively we understand that that's going to have a, a negative impact on our output, our pro productivity. Um, guilt, fear, anxiety can hinder our actual cognitive ability to process information. Um, so we may not be able to even take in information if we're feeling fear, guilt, anxiety. We actually have blocks. And I think those who work in neuroscience know this much better and have done, uh, can speak to the sort of functionality, how this actually works. But the, you know, phenomenon like flooding, for example, when you can't just, you can't hear anything anymore. You can't take any information anymore because of that high level of anxiety, um, anger, fear, the information just doesn't go in. So this is also, I think, important and relevant to those who work in the field of conflict resolution to, to honor these dynamics within a group or within individuals and recognize when that negativity has gone so thick that one can't effect effectively convey information and how to reverse that. And that's another area of research. How do you shift these sorts of things? And I'm sure it's an area where neuroscience can shed quite a lot of light. So um, again, some existing work that's looked at this is uh, how positive goals, setting positive goals can boost the brain's reward circuity, and this encourages happier and pr more productive uh, behavior. Also, I was mentioning that the work of Professor LeBaron has been looking, most recently she has an article called The Deepest Sense, Revitalizing the Link Between Law and Touch, which looks at how positive touch or encouragement, shaking hands, um, patting the back, this has a very powerful influence. Um, 
and can change or alter a dynamic within an interpersonal or group setting. So it's something also to really look into and to study more deeply. How do, how do these dynamics work also in a mediation context, in these informal settings? Um, so just as a group, as a question for, for the group itself, um, how do you see sort of positive, uh, a po setting a positive tone, um, reducing anxiety or looking toward the future? How do you see this affecting or impacting mediation or conflict resolution practice that you've been a part of? Or vice versa, how has negativity hindered the ability to achieve outcome? If anyone has any experience Thank you. As mediators, even if we can't see a solution, we can bring the evidence-based understanding that we have seen many matters settle. And once we do that and express a positive expectation that this matter can also settle, it creates an atmosphere of possibility in the room that the parties themselves may not bring in, especially if they're not repeat players and for them this conflict has a big charge. That's a, that's a wonderful example. That, yeah, so many times individuals may come for the first time to a case and they're just flooded with anxiety. And this is, seems like the largest hurdle that one has to overcome and that nobody in the world has overcome such a hurdle. This is <laughs> the mountain and, you know, and there's a great deal of fear. And so that sense that such things have been resolved and resolved quite well and effectively and people have moved on to bigger and better things and more productive or happier outcomes, that can have a tremendous impact, especially, like you say, for those who are coming at it for the first time. Um, and so that's where the experience of the mediator is really important, that long-term uh, experience of a, s many types of similar cases or similar, um, these sorts of outcomes can provide a positive outlook. Are there other examples or cases that anyone wishes to share, either positive or negative? Yes. Uh, maybe let me give you a case, uh, an experience in a mediation where I acted for a party and there was supreme meeting held by the mediator with the other party while we were waiting. And the mediator then came back, not on a door, I represented the parties, so I opened the door and the mediator said to me, uh, Mr. Leung, I have two pieces of news to bring to you, a piece of good news and a piece of bad news. And on my mind I think, how come on the media's mind there is bad news? And I said, sir, up to you. And he said, Mr. Leung, the good news is that this is first separate meeting that I met the other party. Uh, they they uh, authorized me to convey to you an offer. That's good news. The bad news is that the offer is way, way below your client's claim. I don't think your client will accept it. I think that's very poor. I think the effect will be much different if he omitted simply uh, do not tell us the bad news. Uh, that's his personal opinion. So right. remain positive is very important yeah. for mediators. Uh, so always hope, guys. That's a very good example because he's primed the client now to reject. He's, he's kind of set the person up to say no because he's, a, whereas other factors may have influenced the client to accept it that we don't know about or they may be operating by values other than monetary values. So. But he's precluded some of these options by anticipating the response. Yeah, that's a very good example. Sometimes we can shut doors for people. Any other examples or cases? Yes. Uh, recently, I, I uh, was in a mediation as the mediator highly emotional family mediation uh, with a senior counsel in, in my room and of course the parties. Um, 
You know, uh, the usual uh, highly emotional exchanges, uh, people uh, started to yell and shout. So um, I did not enforce any ground rules at all. I just put up my hand with a big smile, like waving at other people at the amusement park, you know, <laughs> like this, right. So everybody, that's a very small room, you know, I wave. So they all stop so that I could talk, right. <laughs> and then after, after a short while, uh, the same, you know, exchanges, highly emotional uh, uh, yelling came. And the senior counsel, she did the same as what I had done, waving like uh, with the big smile, like my turn, right. So I asked her to talk. And then gradually, the parties, the husband and wife, they did the same, <laughs> right? So they follow what we have uh, just demonstrated to mm. them. Rather than, you know, the usual stuff of uh, enforcing the ground rule, one, when one party is doing the talking, you should not interrupt. So uh, through that, you know, if you are positive, you encourage people to be positive and behave positively. They will follow suit, and, and, and that's very interesting. You know, uh, 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 that's uh, something I would like to share with everyone. That's a you. wonderful example. Right. Like you were saying, the, the setting the tone, appealing to the higher nature of the individual. Like each of us, we can really sink into very deep depths of selfishness and aggression, or we can also transcend those. And if you have an example in front of you of someone who is transcending that, or who is looking for that better part of the nature of individuals and demonstrating, because a mediator can get also very frustrated and could yell and could sort of lay down the law. And that could be a very natural response in that situation. But by overcoming that frustration and having a smile and showing a different way of, uh, of calling attention without shouting, it presented another model for the group. And that seemed to have a ripple effect. It's great. OK, so these are some examples of positivity. And we see now directly that there is some linkage with mediation practice as well and the facilitation of mediation dynamic. Um, and we see this in groups as well. We were discussing on the bus, there's uh, research that has come out of Google that teams, the teams that are most effective within Google, they're not the smartest teams or even the most diverse teams, but really it's the teams that show mutual regard, empathy, a space where each party has a place to talk, and also what they call conversational turn-taking. Each person has a chance to share their viewpoint. And I think it's similar to some of these findings here that um, expressions of care are very important in helping people feel understood, release tension, um, and this will enhance performance. Okay, so then the last part is some research that I've been working on. This is more in the legal field, um, and it looks at how different models of institutional um, court-directed mediation, how this impacts the both the user's perception of confidence in the system, perception of justice, and if efficiency of the outcome based on whether they are mandated to use mediation or if, whether they are nudged or encouraged um, to, to use the mediation process. Um, there's a lot of work, and again, we were talking on the bus. The bus is a very <laughs> dynamic place. About the nudge uh, theory work that's come out recently by Thaler and Sunstein. Recently, Thaler won a Nobel Prize for this work on nudging, which is basically um, described as how you know, positive encouragement um, can be at least as effective, if not more effective, than direct, traditional dir directions issued through mandates or legislation, um, and encouraging non-force compliance. And there's a lot of debate, a lot of interesting work being done in this field in neuroscience, also in behavioral economics, law and economics, social psychology, various fields are looking at this idea of nudging or encouragement um, through, um, and the way this operates are various mechanisms. So for example, one of these in public health, putting fruit at eye level, say you're in a cafeteria for students, 
the thing at eye level is found to be the thing that people tend towards or gravi gravitate towards. So some of the ideas of applying this is you know, putting fruit at this level so students may be more inclined to pick it up than candy bar, putting that somewhere else. Um, or targets in urinals. In one country, I think maybe it was Germany, they found that the, the men's toilet was very dirty. Uh, and so they thought, well, let's put a target in the urinal so people can keep the place clean. And they found it was very effective. This is a small nudge. Um, these are kinds of examples of nudges. So, but the, the, the interesting part is people are looking then again at the question of autonomy. And Professor Reiner's work uh, is looking at how nudges interact with um, uh, individual choice. And so this is very important, both in the legal context as well as mediation context. What is the degree of individual choice uh, involved in both deciding to pursue uh, a mediated outcome and also coming up with a final solution uh, for, the, for the particular dispute. Um, and so what's very interesting um, out of the work that I read just as earlier this week when I saw that um, uh, Professor Reiner was coming is this description of decision variable. And later you can talk to him more directly about it. But from what I understand, it's this idea that um, a combination of three things can, af can influence our choice of whether we take option A or B. And this could be sensory evidence, our stored memory, and subjective value of options. And this may make one option more desirable than another. But we still have our autonomy, our choice, uh, to decide whether we're going to select A or B. And so this is very important, because some of the critique of nudge theory is that you're taking people's autonomy away, and is that right? Can pe people still need to be able to choose? Um, but here, I think we can find that uh, in all cases, I think we're influenced by multiple factors, by so many things within our life, our family upbringing, the media, the various uh, cult cultural norms within our workplace. All of these things nudge us in some way, or affect our, our thinking. Um, and so here, the, the question is, how can we create environments that optimize a positive choice? So uh, when we're looking at, for example, the context of court medi mediation, um, there are different models. And I know that Hong Kong, for example, was looking very carefully at this question for many years before it decided, um, before it embarked on this civil justice um, reform process. It looked at many different jurisdictions and how uh, court mediation could be designed. Um, and as you know, and many of you are familiar here, there's a variety of spectrum of approaches. And in some cases, it's not a clear cut um, mandatory or sort of encouraged process. You have um, judges that might be provided in the court or mediators who are part of or annexed with the court who are available to help parties resolve conflicts. Uh, you could have part, uh, judges who suggest or inform or educate parties about mediation. Or you could have opt-in mechanisms where parties can choose to join or opt out. So your default position is that you must mediate a certain type of case unless you opt out. Um, or you could have cost sanctions, as we do in Hong Kong, for unreasonable refusal to try mediation. So these are the spectrums, among others, uh, the types of approaches that may be introduced by a court. Um, so the research that uh, I was looking at was, um, and again, what, what drives or motivates this are a number of different motivations. They could be intrinsic and in extrinsic. So intrinsic are things like um, reducing case backlog, efficiency of the court, saving money, saving taxpayer money. And there can also be various extrinsic relational process-based considerations, peace building, improving relationships. Um, these are other factors that can influence the design of how a court will say, OK, these types of cases should be uh, mediated or not. And when we look at the global level in terms of UNSATRAL model conciliation uh, uh, rules, this really leaves the question of how parties arrive at mediation quite open. And so there we see a, across the world a variety of a spectrum of approaches. Um, 
And again, there's legal theory, legal debate about this. So what is the role of um, informal methods within the formal court system? And this goes very far back between you know, Lon Fuller, Owen Fiss. They had a very lively, heated debate. Owen Fiss was of the view that the uh, civil claims, uh, the courts, is, uh, courts are only a place to resolve in a, in a pol it, it sort of through a pol polarity of, of viewpoints, the right outcome uh, for civil claims. And there's only one right outcome, and it should be decided by the judge. Whereas uh, Fuller saw that those, especially in relationships of heavy interdependence, there is a place, or polycentric disputes, there is a place for more informal um, uh, processes to help parties think of solutions that they may not otherwise, or that the law could not provide, or the law was limited um, in its forward-looking ability uh, to provide to parties. And so there is this debate. What is the place of mediation or informal mechanisms in the court? And there is a lot of literature about uh, this, this question. Um, so in the research that, that was done just up to this point, um, two types of models were looked at. And basically, the way that they were defined, the mandatory or robust encouragement, were those systems where there was mandatory assignment for all cases in a particular category or following under a certain amount, compelled orders or medi mediators provided by courts. And then the nudged or voluntary process was informal information, party-directed mediation, um, cost sanctions for unreasonable refusal, and this opt-out mechanism. So this was the kind of categorization that was used. It's not a, by any means a perfect categorization, but it was an effort to sort of um, characterize and then look at the outcomes. So 10 countries were studied. Um, five in each type of jurisdiction. So voluntary was uh, looked at United Kingdom, Hong Kong, France, Netherlands, Malaysia. And mandatory looked at the US, Australia, Italy, China, and India, um, and tracked the type of mediation process with certain types of indicator data. So we have the World Justice Project um, has a rule of law index, which measures things like um, perceptions of uh, rule of law, efficiency, um, fairness, et cetera. Also, the worldwide govern governance indicators were used also to track um, outcomes. And I looked at both a single year comparison and also positive change in these indicators over a five year time period within a single jurisdiction to see how does this kind of program impact change, positive change within the civil justice system. Um, and also spoke to or had survey research with some mediators. Um, so for the basic finding of this research was that for those jurisdictions that used a more voluntary approach or a nudged approach, there were higher scores for efficiency, quality of civil justice, effective enforcement, accessibility, affordability, and lower scores for reported discrimination. Um, and no significant difference for impartiality and effectiveness. So there are a number of limitations for this work. You know, it's a small 10 country sample. Uh, it's non-random. Um, there are so many intervening variables, court financing, socioeconomic conditions. All of these can inf influence the end variable, the end result. So these have to be taken with a lot of many grains of salt um, and not generalizable by any means. So these only speak to the 10 countries that were looked at. Um, but it, they're interesting, I think, in terms of what we're finding or learning about nudges in other contexts, that when people choose to pursue the mediation route, um, as we were discussing earlier, they have buy-in, they've chosen, they've said, okay, I, even though maybe it's, maybe it's not my first choice, I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna try it. Already, that's starting off on a very good foot. And I think as mediators, we understand that, that when parties come in with some investment, in the process, they are more likely to result in a good outcome than those who are kind of pushed in there um, to, to try to work it out. That being said, there are some cases where I think there is a very long history where mandated uh, processes could be positive, like say in a family context, where for the sake of children, it may be beneficial for those even who may not consider it to try at least um, a mediation process. So, Again, this is the breakdown, and this will come out later, um, later this year by 
uh, if you're interested, I can send you the link to this, um, to these uh, findings. But this is basically breaking down what was just shared, that for these various indicators, the voluntary programs tended to do better. Um, as for the five-year change, so I was also interested, because when I shared this research with a friend of mine, another colleague who teaches law, he said, okay, that's interesting, but again, you have all these intervening variables, et cetera. So, so then the thought was, why not look at a single country itself and compare it to itself five years ago and, to, and then five years into the future? How does it change or improve with regard to these various indicators, um, depending on the type of program that it applies? And so, again, similarly to the single year uh, comparison, over a five year time period, you do tend to find that those implementing a voluntary sort of nudged mediation program did tend to do better in terms of positive improvement or change over these indicators, efficiency, accessibility, no delay, um, enforcement, impartiality, rule of law, no discrimination. So the black line is the voluntary program, and the lighter gray is the mandated. And so you do see over t a five-year time period slightly higher improvements in these uh, jurisdictions. Again, the same limitations apply as, as described before. Then this is the survey of the practitioners. So here we see a slight variation. So practitioners or mediators or those in the court system tend to see mandatory prog programs um, as they have more confidence in the mandatory programs, probably because they're in the program and, and regard these programs with greater degree of confidence. Um, both uh, practitioners see the program as relative, both types of program as equally fair. Um, efficiency is interesting. So even when you ask practitioners or judges who work in the court or administrators who design these programs, they acknowledge that the voluntary uh, program tends to be more efficient. First, probably because you don't have to pay for it as a court. Second of all, most of those cases do resolve because the parties choose to come into the process themselves of their free, free will. So they do tend to be slightly more efficient. Um, OK, and then finally, these are some strengths and challenges of both methods. Um, and I think they're somewhat intuitive. For, for the mandatory robust encouragement, the mandated, the strength is that it normalizes this uh, party-driven resolution. Um, there is perhaps greater speed through case screening, um, and it could contribute to relational repair in appropriate sorts of cases. The challenge is that parties may have a limited understanding of the process. They may try to game the system. They may, um, there could be lawyer conflicts of interest. The lawyer stands to lose fees if the parties mediate, so they may not provide full information, uh, lack of good faith. So these are some of the challenges. For the nudged or voluntary programs, likewise, there are certain strengths, which are um, the procedures can be simple. The mediators tend to be very good quality because they're the ones that the parties tend to go back to. Um, they're, they're be they benefit from ongoing monitoring and evaluation, but they also face challenges. Uh, parties may not know or be aware of mediation, so there may be very little uptake in these types of processes, and there may be limited resources. So a number of administrators who I spoke to around the world um, were quite concerned that these programs are becoming less and less supported by the government and the judiciary, and this is a big problem. Um, and this is reducing options available because of the funding issue. So what is the key takeaway of all of this uh, about encouragement, both individually and also institutionally? Um, I think what we find is that within the interpersonal um, dynamic, this voluntary engagement um, tends to result in higher perceptions of fairness, confidence, and efficiency um, when we have this party buy-in. Um, but that being said, we also find, and this I think corresponds with a lot of the finding and nudge theory that uh, um, non-force compliance can be as effective, if not more effective, than, than mandated. That being said, there are certain situations where robust encouragement or mandated mediation could be very effective, especially where there is a heavy interdependence between the parties. And 
not only the two individuals stand to benefit, but those who are affected by that relationship, say children in child welfare disputes. There is a benefit for encouraging um, at least one attempt at mediation because of the broader impact on, on the entire family for this process. So I'll just leave it at that and see if there are any questions or comments or reflections before we pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you for your input and also your participation.